Welcome to the Florida Gardener podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer, and today is all about the things you shouldn't do in the garden. We all make mistakes, and they can be a valuable part of learning. But if it feels like you're constantly at war with your yard, or you are new to Florida gardening, avoiding these plant fails will help expedite your learning curve. Number one is not paying attention to your garden. My plant just died out of nowhere, is a line I have heard many times. The truth is, plants don't typically die overnight. When something is wrong, it's usually, I'm not going to say all the time, but it's usually a slow decline. The key is to make going into your garden a routine, or as I like to put it, become an observer of your outdoor living room. Flowers and plants are not pieces of artwork you can hang on the wall and forget about. They are alive and always changing. And that's what makes them so interesting and wonderful. Every morning after I make a cup of coffee, I grab my mug and my chocolate lab mousse and we stroll together through the yard, taking mental notes of anything that may seem off or need extra attention after work hours or during the weekend. This morning stroll only takes five to 10 minutes and you don't have to do it daily. I just really enjoy the process. It's meditative for me, but once a week is perfectly fine. Number two is using red mulch. Just please, don't do it. I heard a contractor once say it reminds him of Ronald McDonald's Playhouse, and I can't say I disagree. You guys heard me in the last episode. There are no bad plants, just bad landscapes. And I really think that goes for most everything. I try to be open-minded, even outside of the plant space. It's usually just all about how something is presented to us. But when it comes to red mulch, it's just never a good idea. I promise, don't do it. The third garden mistake you want to avoid making is buying 15 different plants instead of multiples of the same. You're going to make a bigger impact if you buy five caladiums, five salvia, and five gold mound, rather than one caladium, one salvia, one gold mound, and then 12 other totally different plants. Create repetition in the garden by planting in groups or drifts. It's pleasing to the eye. A larger grouping of salvia followed by a larger grouping of caladiums is going to make a bigger impact than one salvia here and one caladium there and so on and so forth. Moving on to the next mistake, which is daily shallow watering instead of occasional deep watering. This goes for in-ground beds and planters. Now there's someone specifically that comes to mind when I bring this one up, but I know many of us are guilty of it. I watch her spray her plants every morning with a quick burst of water. Instead, she could just do one deep watering every week. It's better for the plants. When you just spray the surface of the soil, it trains the plant roots to stay up at the top because, well, that's where the water is. When you deeply water, it teaches the roots to grow deep. This creates a healthier, stronger root system. Living in Florida, it also helps protect your plants from tropical storms and hurricanes. Think about it. Those deeper roots almost act as a stake, helping the plant weather the storm, compared to a plant with a weak, shallow root system that could easily break and topple over. Numero cinco. Going to the wrong type of nursery or garden center. Think of big box garden centers as a primary doctor. They are a generalist. If you need help with something specific, your primary is going to refer you to a specialist. That specialist, let's just say it's a cardiologist, is going to be able to answer a lot more questions about your heart health than your primary can. In the same way, many smaller or local nurseries specialize in something. This could be native plants, orchids and bromeliads, fruit trees, bedding flowers, large ornamental flowering trees, or even shade plants and indoor foliage. So if you're looking for something specific or you need guidance, maybe you're trying to start a backyard fruit orchard and you don't know what plants are best, going to a local nursery that sells fruit trees is going to be better than going to a big box store. Another difference is the plants that big box stores get in are shipped all over your state. And we all know Jacksonville is different than Miami. Whereas your smaller mom and pop nursery tends to be hyper-localized when it comes to the plants that they carry. 
Now I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth here because not all small local nurseries make the same amount of effort or care to help you if you have questions. But if you can find a good local one, hold on to them like the piece of treasure they are. And I also saw a big box store recently advertising that they were carrying pollinator plants that had not been sprayed with pesticides, which is a huge step in the right direction. I use both local and big box garden stores. When you go to a big box store, you need to know what you want. Don't go in planning to ask the sales associate questions. They're not typically trained on plants or have an interest in them. And it's not their fault, so don't be rude to them either. It's just the business model. So the sooner you can accept that, the better off you will be. Know what you want and do your research ahead of time. And don't expect a really unique selection. You could get lucky, but they are probably going to have the same standard plants you see everywhere. Like I said earlier, they are generalists. So if I need to pick up something simple or standard, blue days, mondo grass, or even mulch and soil, that's where I'm going. But if I'm trying to start an edible veg or herb garden, create a pollinator garden with natives, or want really cool, unique tropical and flowering plants, I'm not headed there. Sixth mistake you can make is buying the wrong plants. I have two hacks when it comes to avoiding this mistake. Hack one, don't read a bunch of random articles, listen to some chick on TikTok. Shoot, don't even listen to me. Just Google where the plant originates. This will give you a pretty good idea of if a plant will do well in your area. When you Google where do violas originate, it says temperate North America. So it totally makes sense then that they would do better in Seattle than Orlando. When you Google where do roses originate, it says Central Asia. Central Asia is cold and low in humidity. On the other hand, when I Google plumeria, it says tropical regions of the Americas from Mexico to Northern South America and islands of the Caribbean. Plumerias do really well here, so that totally makes sense. And just as a disclaimer, just because something doesn't originate in a tropical warm area doesn't mean you can't grow it here because we have created tons of different varieties and hybrids of plants, but it's still a really great rule of thumb. Now, the other way you can avoid buying the wrong plants is by observing where the plants are located when you're at the nursery. If they are in a shade house, or if you notice a shade cloth draped over the top of where you're walking, the plants there will probably prefer a shadier spot in your garden, or they might be a fantastic house plant. Plants such as monsteras and wild coffee are going to prefer shade or partial shade. Notice that they're growing out in a sunny field. They will probably be happy in a sunny spot at your house. Plants such as lantana and alamanda vine are going to benefit from full sun or part sun. Moving on to the next mistake, which is immediately planting everything when you get home. Place the plants in your bed while they are still in their pots. That way you can get a feel for how they will look in your landscape before you start digging. More often than not, you're gonna wanna move something around. Now, once you're satisfied with the positioning of the plants, leave them there still potted for a couple days so that you can observe how they handle the conditions. Are any becoming scorched from the sun? Is there an area of your yard that collects more water or is susceptible to wind? This gives you another opportunity to make adjustments before you plant them in the ground. FYI, make sure to keep your plants watered during this process as the black nursery pots do dry out quick. And speaking of pots, I clearly just like talking about containers because number eight's mistake is selecting the wrong pots. We won't harp too much on this, but stay away from small pots. You're going to be watering every day. Possible, go for a 20 inch diameter or larger. Large pots hold more soil, which means they hold more moisture, which means you don't have to water them all the time. This also means the plants have more room to grow and create a healthy root system. And last but not least, it aesthetically looks better to have a few nice large pots really decked out rather than 15 tiny pots scattered around, which just creates a cluttered, messy feel. And here's a quick tip on this. If it's a very oversized pot, you can mix in mulch. I like using mini pine bark nuggets. But anyway, create like a layering effect in the bottom half of the pot. 
add a bit of potting soil, then mulch, then soil, then mulch. You get it. Mulch is less expensive than soil, so you'll fill the container for less money and the mulch will slowly break down and feed your plants. You can go back and listen to episode four, which is all about container design and selection, if you want to learn more about this. Over fertilizing is the ninth mistake on the list. Maybe this is a garden sin, but I don't ever listen to plant tags or online articles when it comes to fertilizing requirements. A plant will tell you if it's hungry. If it's happily blooming and the foliage looks green and healthy, it probably doesn't need that recommended or scheduled dose of fertilizer. The tenth thing you want to avoid is unrealistic expectations or visions. What can you really manage? Small plants are okay. They are easier to handle and less money. Have you ever tried to haul a 25-gallon, 10-foot majesty palm to the truck by yourself? I have, and it ain't fun. The typical backyard gardener, I recommend sticking with 7-gallon pots or smaller. Also, be cautious with Pinterest, especially when it comes to houseplant styling and interior scape. I've seen really cute metal indoor wall planters style with succulents. Just because they are succulents doesn't mean they don't need watering, you guys. So eventually that metal container is going to rust and you will have water damage on your wall. Number 11, plant shopping during the weekend. Okay, so I get it, we have to work. Not everyone has the flexibility to visit their garden center during the week. But if you do, I totally recommend it. Plant shopping on a Tuesday is the most relaxing experience. No crowds, you can take your time deciding what you want without having to navigate around other people or waiting in long lines to check out. And if you have questions, the staff can better help you as they are less busy dealing with other customers. Number 12 is killing every bug you see. Most of the bugs you see on your plants are not harmful. They are beneficial insects. They are the good guys and only a small majority are going to cause permanent or fatal destruction to your plant. When you apply an insecticide, you aren't just killing the quote unquote bad bugs, but you are also killing the good bugs. Beneficial insects eat bad insects. So they're like the OG of organic insecticides, nature's version of it, or a cleanup crew. But they can't do their job if we keep spraying. It messes up the natural rhythm of things. I have lots of Florida native blanket flower in my beds and I'll occasionally see aphids, but they never get out of hand or do enough damage to kill an entire plant. I'll see them one day clustered together on a stem and then a couple days later they are gone. Maybe something ate them or maybe they just packed up and moved. Either way, we tend to think seeing a few bugs leads to an apocalyptic end of times type of devastation. Now, when it comes to growing edibles, I get it. And obviously, if you're a commercial grower, things are a bit different. But for the backyard gardener, you're gonna be okay. And if it's something that starts to cause serious damage and just continues to happen over and over and over again, I would stop buying that plant. When I first moved into my townhome, there were gardenia bushes here and they were covered in sooty mold. And I just couldn't get rid of it for the life of me. Obviously, this is a plant disease, not an insect, but an annoyance either way. Anyways, I knew it wasn't an isolated issue because a few of my neighbors have them and theirs were covered with sooty mold too. I yanked all the gardenias out and replaced them with a Florida-friendly low-maintenance plant. Boom. Problem solved. Number 13 is the last mistake we have for you today, and that is believing you can prevent weeds. I'm going to squash that dream for you. I don't care what you use, weed barrier, sprays, prayer, you're not ever going to 100% get rid of them. The sooner you can accept that, the better. Now here's the good news. You can significantly decrease the presence of them in your yard. Here are the three things I like to do to help. Number one, mulch or rock your beds. If you're gonna mulch, you need to keep up with this. You don't just mulch once, you're gonna wanna do this once to twice a year. Number two, plant densely. This helps create competition for the weeds and crowds out those younger weed seedlings. And number three, pull them. Don't let the weeds become mature. Once they are mature, they go to seed. Once those seeds spread, it's tough to manage. 
But if you pull them while they're young, not only are you getting rid of the weeds that you see today, but you're also helping to reduce the germination of new weed seeds in the future. Consistency is key. All right, guys, that wraps up episode seven of the Florida Gardener. We will see you next week for episode eight. And in the meantime, if you'd like to download one of my Etsy garden templates or check out my social, you can access everything through my website, rootsredefined.com. That's roots, R-O-O-T-S, redefined, R-E-D-E-F-I-N-E-D.com. All right, thanks guys. We'll see you again soon.